Hello, my name is Cesar. Uh, this is the serverless talk. A little bit about me. I work at the Web Republic. I've been using Python for a while. I come from Mexico, so excuse me my, if my accent is a bit thick. Uh, I'm co-organizing co -organizing the Swiss Python Summit, also the Zurich Python User Group. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. Let's talk about uh, uh, a little bit of uh, architecture archaeology. Maybe somebody of you remember good old uh, client server. When I, when I was a bit younger, or, or much younger actually, in university, this was like the latest and greatest architecture. Uh, it was basically a really fat server, most of the times on-premises server, that did everything. Uh, logic, display, everything. Uh, what you had to do for uh, these kind of architectures is you had to buy a, a machine, a server, that was uh, big enough, right? So that was kind of a big upfront investment. It required quite some capacity planning. I'm, I'm going to come back to this concept of capacity planning later. And scaling was a nightmare. Uh, now, let's move a bit forward to the future uh, at current uh, architectures. Now we have cloud, which is a blessing for many of us, uh, because more or less servers are disposable. That is, in the past, you used to treat servers as pets, because you named them, you took care of them, and now they are basically cattle. You can kill them anytime you want. Uh, if you make a proper design, these kinds of uh, architectures can make it really good to scale, really easy. But there's still the, the problem of capacity planning. And if you buy a server that is maybe sitting idle for, for a long time, you still get to pay uh, some money for it. So why is, why is uh, capacity planning an issue? Well. There are many questions around it, like uh, basically most of the, uh, or many of the problems uh, in the IT field in terms of financial uh, finances was capacity planning, like how many servers do we buy, uh, how many cores, how many CPUs do we have, how much memory do we need, do we need big amounts or little amounts, and what if we buy too many resources? Or what if we buy too little resources? Uh, and then how do we dynamically uh, shrink or grow the resources, right? And then the, there's the problem that uh, servers or hardware becomes obsolete as soon as it leaves uh, the factory. Uh, what if we get uh, features in, a, I don't know, in the news or in some important website? So. Serverless is a very simple yet powerful idea. Uh, the concept is you don't do the processing yourself. Instead, you take uh, just a processing task, work units, and then you just give them away for somebody else to, to perform. And then you pay only for the time that uh, these computations were done. So, well, there's actually a server. Uh, it's, not, it's just not your server anymore. It's just somebody else's server. The problem is not yours. The problem is somebody else's. Uh, they are running their servers like in, in a completely managed solution, and you only get to pay for a fraction of the computing time. What does it mean for you? Well, first is you don't have to buy your own servers. You don't need to run them, monitor them. You just uh, generally need to manage them, like apply patches uh, to admin, users, nothing at all. You just send them the work, it gets done, and then you forget about it. Uh, no need for capacity planning, because that's something else's problem, somebody else's problem. 
uh, not yours. And then there is the money savings. Why? Because you only pay for the time that you are using the, the servers. So why does it make me excited? Well, I'm, I'm not getting younger, definitely. So I'm from the time that uh, we had Netscape, that we had uh, Alta Vista instead of Google, that we used uh, books for, uh, because we didn't have Stack Overflow. So if you wanted to learn and solve something, just buy the book, uh, because I used Turbo Pascal and so on. Uh, on a more serious note, uh, because it means potentially unlimited scaling, because now computing resources are disposable, uh, because you, you can think on a higher level, you, don't, you are not constrained by uh, the size of your hardware, uh, because there is this concept of uh, infrastructure as code, because IT assets are basically programmable. Second part of the talk is how do we do this with AWS Lambda? Uh, that is Amazon Web Services serverless platform. Uh, yeah, uh, this platform supports different technologies. Java, of course, Python 2 and Python 3. Go, JavaScript to, to Node.js and uh, .NET as well. Uh, I could describe the process as a five-step uh, thing. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to do a live demo, because uh, that's a recipe for problems. But I'm just going to include some uh, screenshots. So this is how the, how the Amazon AWS uh, Lambda dashboard looks like. And then it's, it's really simple. You create a function, and there's a button for that. Uh, luckily, Amazon provides uh, different templates or blueprints, so you can uh, search for them. In my case, I wanted to use uh, Hello World in Python 3, so that's what I get, the Hello World Python 3. Uh, now, you can, uh, there are several ways you can trigger your Lambda, that is, your code to run. There's, uh, there's a myriad of uh, events in the AWS platform itself that can trigger your code to run, like uh, files being uploaded, like uh, files being removed, and so on. And I know there are many uh, Amazon engineers uh, in Dublin, so if I'm saying something wrong, maybe correct me. Please don't kill me. <laughs> so even uh, Alexa skills, uh, yeah, many, many things. Uh, in my case, I don't want to react to any of those events because this is a basic uh, example. Next step is name your function. Tell it it's Python 3.6. And then uh, they're so nice that uh, they provide you a basic uh, skeleton for code. It's just taking uh, an event and it's tracking three Ks. Uh, there are three ways that you can... Uh, provide your code. One is you can type it directly there. You can also upload a zip file, or you can upload a zip file to Amazon S3. <coughs> uh, there are some advanced settings, like, uh, and this is the only, uh, this, this is probably the only capacity uh, decision that you may need to take. Like, how much memory is the server going to allocate? for this task, and this is important because uh, uh, you pay for as much uh, memory as you use. And you can also configure a timeout, which uh, cannot be longer than five minutes. So this is an important constraint. Uh, yeah, next step is test it. There is a button to test it. Uh, so you can type some input uh, sample input, and then click Save and Test, and then you're going to see a green uh, message. It contains uh, the output of the, the test. Really, really simple. Um, so how do you use it in, from Python? 
one way is uh, you need to create um, a client. And for this, there is the Boto library. Let's explain it uh, in more detail. So as you can see, there is a, there is a main. And the main is going to uh, call invoke lambda. And the only thing fancy we do is from the Boto tree library, we create a Lambda client. That is it. And then we create the payload. And then we call client invoke. The first argument is function name. Of course, you need to give it the name that uh, your function had. And there is a second one, which is important. It's, uh, the first one is request response. This means it's gonna it's gonna be as, it's gonna be synchronous. It's gonna wait for your lambda to complete execution and then get a return value. Second one, if it's an event, it's just gonna be asynchronous. Uh, and then the payload. So the output is uh, quite simple as well. You see a con if, if it's synchronous, you see a content length. You see a content type, which is JSON in this example, an HTTP status code of 200. On the other hand, if it's asynchronous, uh, the content length is zero. There's no content type. And uh, HTTP status code is 202. There's a little precondition to run the exercises. Uh, you need to add some settings. There are two files. AWS config file and AWS credentials. Uh, there are tools to create this, or you can create them by hand. But uh, I mean, in my opinion, this is simple, but uh, it can be even simpler. There is uh, this framework called Zappa. Uh, it's a Python framework for serverless. Uh, it's just a command line tool. Uh, that you can use to manage your application uh, lifecycle. You can create, deploy, update, and undeploy applications. How do you install it? Just with pip. No rocket science. Uh, this, is, this step is optional. You say SAPA uh, in it, and then it, uh, it's going to ask you a couple of questions, and then out of that, it's going to create a JSON file or a JAML file, if you want. And how does the settings file look like? Yeah, that's JSON. Uh, this contains the name of your application. As you can see, my Python file is called example.py. And that's why I have here an example. And then I have a Flask application. And that's uh, app equals Flask. And that's why I have the name app. Then uh, you can tell it uh, in which AWS region you want to run it. Uh, this happens to be Ireland, of course. And a couple of settings more. And then the code is very simple. It does some logging, and then it returns a value. Hello from Flask. Next step is to deploy the application. It does something in the background. It, it's creating a zip file that creates stuff in, uh, in Amazon's uh, cloud. And we are going to come back to this, the keep warm callback in a couple of minutes. Second part of the logs is uh, this. Uh, it's still doing deployment. And then at the end, what you have is uh, a URL. This is uh, the URL you can use to access your application. So. In the, in the first example, we saw that we had to create a Boto3 uh, client to access the Lambda. But now it's getting much simpler. Because now you have a RESTful API, because it's what this uh, URL is. It's just a RESTful API. And then you can access your application or your Lambda from any web browser. Uh, from the command line using curl, wget, or even from other uh, programming languages or platforms. So for this example, I created, uh, yeah, I used curl. 
I also invoked my Lambda from uh, my mobile web browser, and it worked perfectly. It said, uh, hello from Flask. All commands, and you can check the logs, you can update, update your code, code or settings, actually. Or you can get rid of the, the Lambda if you don't need it anymore. Uh, what, what does Lambda, what does Zappa do for you? Uh, well, first thing it does is uh, it creates uh, the deployment uh, package. That means you don't need to create a zip file or you don't need to type it by hand anymore. Uh, it takes the dependencies out of your current virtual environment. Uh, it also has support for stage uh, for environments. So let's go back here. You see? This part, dev, is my staging environment. So I could have dev, test, staging, and production. Right? Really easy. And then you can deploy them in a, an independent basis. Uh, you can manage a lot of settings, like environment, environment variables, login, domain names, and so on. And of course, it creates uh, the RESTful API for you. Uh, what's uh, this is through AWS API Gateway. I really like it. It's one of, one of Amazon's products as well. Uh, by the way, a disclaimer: I don't work for Amazon. I don't get uh, anything from them. I just happen to like uh, what they do. Um, yeah, this is a RESTful API. There's nothing you have to do to get this. Uh, why could you? decide to go for an API, uh, for API gateway because of interoperability. Because um, back in the times uh, when I started using Python, it was really, really painful to operate with other languages, with other platforms. Uh, now, nowadays, it's basically JSON over HTTP, and that's really a blessing. Uh, you can uh, even use uh, other service providers call it from the Google Cloud, maybe, uh, from other AWS technologies, from other languages, even PHP. Uh, the client is not tied to Boto, of course. Uh, you get uh, RESTful, if, if that's something you like. Uh, you also get some uh, throttling limits. And why is this important? Because sometimes you may want to constrain uh, how often uh, your clients access your API, and maybe if they abuse the, the service, you can just revoke their access. And this is just uh, as simple as revoking a token and going to the console and, and saying, this, this token doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's not perfect. There are some pitfalls. There are some tips. As I, as I mentioned, uh, there's a five minutes execution time limit. I think it's okay. If your application needs more processing, it may mean that uh, uh, you may be looking for a different architecture because it's not like a, uh, it's, this is not meant to fix all problems, right? Uh, the calls must be stateless because there's no guarantee that if you save a file in your Lambda, that this is going to exist the next, next time you call it. Uh, many people have tried, and actually, they have managed to save uh, state, like files, uh, I don't know, environment variables. But it, this is not a given. Never take it for granted. Uh, there's also called start. The first time uh, your Lambda runs, it probably needs to be instantiated, like uh, some virtual machine needs to run or needs to be kicked off. and it, may take some time. So uh, this can also happen when the, your Lambda is not used, like there is a low uh, traffic uh, phase. And then they, might ju they may just uh, get rid of it. And then that's why some people come up with the idea of uh, keep warm calls. That is, they call the Lambda every five minutes, every four minutes, to make sure that it's always there. And logging is only to Amazon CloudWatch by default. Uh, pitfalls as well. And this is not a problem of uh, Lambda itself. 
it's a problem of microservices that uh, in the long run, uh, the architecture might be a bit fragmented. And there is no TV connection pooling, and that may, that may be a showstopper for some people. Uh, your data could potentially leave your country. I mean, we are in the EU, so that's fine. For, but for instance, uh, I'm located in Switzerland. I live there. And then for many clients, or for many, especially for many banks, uh, that the data leaves uh, Switzerland, it's always a no-go. And that's a limitation, a limitation that you need to take into consideration. Uh, there's flame wars on uh, how do you handle the repository. And there is potential vendor lock-in. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is uh, kind of a solution which I'm going to mention uh, later on. Some people say flow control and error handling gets tricky, uh, but there is also a solution for that. Uh, there is a different product called uh, AWS Step Functions. Uh, the idea is you get uh, orch orchestration of uh, lambdas. So we have a very simple example that the user uploads uh, an image file, and then you want to convert this to the three different formats, TIFF, JPEG, and PNG. And then you do this in parallel, and then you join everything, the results, to load everything uh, into database, or maybe say you don't support the image. And this is specified to JSON via the Amazon States uh, language. Yeah, uh, there are some blueprints uh, Amazon provides, like uh, polling for, uh, for job completion, waiting, retrying, running stuff in parallel, catching a failure, doing like an if, timing, and so on. Now a little bit of geography matters. Uh, you know, this is how, uh, more or less how Amazon's uh, uh, cloud looks like. They split their network and like uh, they split the world in regions, and regions have availability zones and edge locations, which is something I'm going to clarify later on. But before I want to briefly touch what the a content delivery network is, so let's say you have a, an application, a web application. You have some assets like images, pages, streams, and so on that reside in uh, in Dublin. You deploy them, and then you have a client accessing the application from uh, Chile. And then for the client, it may be a bit uh, slow, the application, because uh, there's a long way to there. So to prevent this, uh, you can have an edge location. That is, Amazon uh, transfer your content to different locations around the world. And then if somebody from Chile sends a submit a request, then it gets uh, the image, maybe, gets uh, served by a server in Sao Paulo. And then somebody thought uh, that the same could happen to Lambda functions, right? You deploy into a region, maybe Ireland, one more time. But there is uh, the risk of high la latency. And then Amazon already has uh, the edge location, so why not? reuse them. And then what you have there is you can, uh, you can deploy, and this is in a transparent way, you can deploy your lambdas into edge locations. And then the, the client from Chile that is invoking not, a, not a, an image, but a lambda, is being served from Sao Paulo. And that increases uh, performance. A bit of pricing. Uh, the first dosis is free. As they say, uh, Amazon has a, a rather generous uh, free tire. Uh, for instance, the first million requests per month are free, and that's uh, uh, quite generous in my opinion. And after all, you pay only 20, uh, 20 cents of dollar per million. In my opinion, this is their chip. Uh, but there's also another pillar on which they bill you. Uh, and it, this is the amount of time that your code run, and also the amount of memory allocated for your operations. And the third pillar is uh, 
how much data you transferred outside the Amazon uh, cloud. Maybe if you were uh, hosting data uh, into the Amazon cloud, you have to pay for that as well. Uh, if sh should you decide to use API Gateway, you get to pay as much as 3.5 per million API, API calls received. Alternatives, there is Google Cloud Functions, which as far as I know is in beta, uh, only supports JavaScript and doesn't support uh, uh, environment variables, which is a showstopper for me. Uh, if you actually wanted to use Microsoft products, there is something for the Azure platform as well. There are other options in the Python ecosystem. There is Kalis and Apex, but I, uh, to be honest, I haven't tried them. Uh, there's a company developing kind of vendor agnostic solutions, and that's the serverless framework. And their promise is that you develop once, and then you can deploy it to any cloud that supports this kind of function as a service. Mm -hmm. So I'm mostly done. Now a shameless blog. Uh, I'm also the organizer of the Swiss Python Summit. We're going to have one in February 16. It's really close to Zurich. I would love to see some people from here. We have beautiful mountains. We have uh, a lot of nice things to see there. We have a call for proposal, which is still open. Um, and there's a website if you want to check it out. Uh, I hope you like the, the talk. Uh, if there's something you want to discuss, there's going to be time for questions. I'm available out there. And if you like it as well, you, you may invite me a Guinness. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So we have time for some questions. Yes, please. So, uh, as per your uh, demo here, uh, the input uh, to the serverless function can only be passed via a JSON. There has to be a payload every time. There doesn't have to be a payload. Like, uh, no, if, like I wrote a simple function, say, I, I, there is a function I hosted in Lambda which takes a name and say, hello, name. So, I, my input is basically a string that is a name. So, do I have mm -hmm. to pass it via a JSON or? Is there other way to like do that? Yeah, well, you can do a lot of things. You can, uh, for instance, take uh, events. Like, uh, for instance, if you want to process an image, you you may not want to receive the image uh, itself as the argument. You maybe are given the the path to an S3 bucket, and then you can retrieve the image from the S3 bucket itself and then process it. So yeah, there's uh, just many, many ways to, to pass uh, data to lambdas, not just the, the signature itself. Thank you. Hey, how are the debugging tools on the AWS Lambda? Is, th is there any ways how you debug when, when you need to, or is that something you need to do offsite? Uh, there are plenty of tools. Um, you know, this, this kind of products, uh, as far as I know, are what, uh, what support the Amazon.com uh, platform, like the shop itself. That's what Amazon uses. So they have a lot of tools, like uh, if you want to check the logs like in different levels, there's a CloudWatch, which basically records of the logs. You can save them to an S3 bucket, and you can see the whole dump of things that happen. There is uh, X-Ray, I think, which you can use to trace how a request went uh, like all over the place. There is as well, uh, there's many, there are many audit tools like CloudTrail, I think, that's more on the security level uh, side that uh, you can see who did what because uh, Amazon uses that for like a, to comply with different regulations, like for health uh, services, for government, and so on. So yeah, really, there are plenty of things you can use to, to debug. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Is there anyone else? Uh, 
Um, just one thing. Do you, do you get any detail on what kind of interpreter Amazon are giving you? Is it the C Python? Or could you use PyPy? Or if you're using any Cython code, do you know, would it just work? Or is there problems there? No, uh, the only thing they say is uh, Python 3.6, and then uh, basically it sticks to the specification. But they don't tell you like uh, further details. OK. Yeah. OK, well, if there are no more questions. There's, there's somebody oh. else. Okay. Sorry. Hello. Um, more than a question, I would just like to make a comment about the DB pooling. Um, you can actually, inside the, in the, if in the global scope of the function, you save your database connection, you can actually reuse it if the container is used. So the cost of establishing connections is um, quite reduced on that. Just, well, just a little comment on that. Yep. So that saves you uh, lots of establishing of connections. It's not like pooling, but it re definitely reduces the impact. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for okay. the input. Thank you. Somebody else? No. Well, thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>